Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years in those countries where Catholicism is not in the ascendancy, and the Papists are taking a conciliatory course in order to gain influence. There is an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the Reformed churches from the Papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaining ground that, after all, we do not differ so widely upon vital points as has been supposed and that a little concession on our part will bring us into better understanding with Rome. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience which had been so dearly purchased. They taught their children to abhor popery and held that to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed the defenders of the papacy declare that the church has been maligned and the Protestant world are inclined to accept the statement. Many urge that it is unjust to judge the church of today by the abominations and absurdities that marked her reign during the centuries of ignorance and darkness. They excuse her horrible cruelty as the result of the barbarism of the times and plead that the influence of modern civilization has changed her sentiments. Have these persons forgotten the claim of infallibility put forth for 800 years by this haughty power? So far from being relinquished, this claim was affirmed in the 19th century with greater positiveness than ever before. As Rome asserts that the church never erred, nor will it, according to the scriptures, ever err, John L. von Moschein, Institutes of Ecclesiastical History, Book 3, Century 11, Part 2, Chapter 2, Section 9, Note 17. How can she renounce the principles which governed her course in past ages? The Papal Church will never relinquish her claim to infallibility. All that she has done in her persecution of those who reject her dogmas, she holds to be right. And would she not repeat the same acts, should the opportunity be presented? Let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed, and Rome be reinstated in her former power and there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. A well-known writer speaks thus of the attitude of the papal hierarchy as regards freedom of conscience, and of the perils which especially threaten the United States from the success of her policy. There are many who are disposed to attribute any fear of Roman Catholicism in the United States to bigotry or childishness. Such see nothing in the character and attitude of Romanism that is hostile to our free institutions or find nothing portentous in its growth. Let us then first compare some of the fundamental principles of our government with those of the Catholic Church. The Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical letter of August 15, 1854, said, The absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error, a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. The same Pope, in his encyclical letter of December 8, 1864, anathematized those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship, also all such as maintain that the Church may not employ force. The pacific tone of Rome in the United States does not imply a change of heart. She is tolerant where she is helpless, says Bishop O'Connor, religious liberty is merely endured until the opposite can be carried into effect without peril to the Catholic world. The Archbishop of St. Louis once said, heresy and unbelief are crimes, and in Christian countries as in Italy and Spain, for instance, where all the people are Catholics, and where the Catholic religion is an essential part of the law of the land, they are punished as other crimes. Every cardinal, archbishop, and bishop in the Catholic Church takes an oath of allegiance to the Pope, in which occur the following words, Heretics, schismatics, and rebels to our said Lord, the Pope, or his aforesaid successors, I will to my utmost persecute and oppose. Josiah Strong, Our Country, Chapter 5, Paragraphs 2 to 4. It is true that there are real Christians in the Roman Catholic Communion, thousands in that church are serving God according to the best light they have. They are not allowed access to his word, and therefore they do not discern the truth. They have never seen the contrast between a living heart service and a round of mere forms and ceremonies. 
God looks with pitying tenderness upon these souls, educated as they are in a faith that is delusive and unsatisfying. He will cause rays of light to penetrate the dense darkness that surrounds them. He will reveal to them the truth as it is in Jesus, and many will yet take their position with his people. But Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than at any former period in her history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Catholicism is gaining ground upon every side. See the increasing number of her churches and chapels in Protestant countries. Look at the popularity of her colleges and seminaries in America, so widely patronized by Protestants. Look at the growth of ritualism in England and the frequent defections to the ranks of the Catholics. These things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure principles of the gospel. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. Many Protestants suppose that the Catholic religion is unattractive and that its worship is a dull, meaningless round of ceremony. Here they mistake. While Romanism is based upon deception, it is not a coarse and clumsy imposture. The religious service of the Roman Church is a most impressive ceremonial. Its gorgeous display and solemn rites fascinate the senses of the people and silence the voice of reason and conscience. The eye is charmed. Magnificent churches, imposing processions, golden altars, jeweled shrines, choice paintings, and exquisite sculpture appeal to the love of beauty. The ear is also captivated. The music is unsurpassed. The rich notes of the deep-toned organ, blending with the melody of many voices as it swells through the lofty domes and pillared aisles of her grand cathedrals, cannot fail to impress the mind with awe and reverence. This outward splendor, pomp, and ceremony that only mocks the longings of the sin-sick soul is an evidence of inward corruption. The religion of Christ needs not such attractions to recommend it. In the light shining from the cross, true Christianity appears so pure and lovely that no external decorations can enhance its true worth. It is the beauty of holiness, a meek and quiet spirit, which is of value with God. Brilliancy of style is not necessarily an index of pure, elevated thought. High conceptions of art, delicate refinement of taste, often exist in minds that are earthly and sensual. They are often employed by Satan to lead men to forget the necessities of the soul, to lose sight of the future, immortal life, to turn away from their infinite helper, and to live for this world alone. A religion of externals is attractive to the unrenewed heart. The pomp and ceremony of the Catholic worship has a seductive, bewitching power by which many are deceived, and they come to look upon the Roman Church as the very gate of heaven. None but those who have planted their feet firmly upon the foundation of truth and whose hearts are renewed by the Spirit of God are proof against her influence. Thousands who have not an experimental knowledge of Christ will be led to accept the forms of godliness without the power. Such a religion is just what the multitudes desire. The Church's claim to the right to pardon leads the Romanists to feel at liberty to sin and the ordinance of confession, without which her pardon is not granted, tends also to give license to evil. He who kneels before fallen man and opens in confession the secret thoughts and imaginations of his heart is debasing his manhood and degrading every noble instinct of his soul. In unfolding the sins of his life to a priest, an erring, sinful mortal, and too often corrupted with wine and licentiousness, his standard of character is lowered, and he is defiled in consequence. His thought of God is degraded to the likeness of fallen humanity, for the priest stands as a representative of God. 
This degrading confession of man to man is the secret spring from which has flowed much of the evil that is defiling the world and fitting it for the final destruction. Yet to him who loves self-indulgence, it is more pleasing to confess to a fellow mortal than to open the soul to God. It is more palatable to human nature to do penance than to renounce sin. It is easier to mortify the flesh by sackcloth and nettles and galling chains than to crucify fleshly lusts. Heavy is the yoke which the carnal heart is willing to bear rather than bow to the yoke of Christ. There is a striking similarity between the Church of Rome and the Jewish Church at the time of Christ's first advent. While the Jews secretly trampled upon every principle of the law of God, they were outwardly rigorous in the observance of its precepts, loading it down with exactions and traditions that made obedience painful and burdensome. As the Jews professed to revere the law, so do Romanists claim to reverence the cross. They exalt the symbol of Christ's sufferings, while in their lives they deny him whom it represents. Papists place crosses upon their churches, upon their altars, and upon their garments. Everywhere is seen the insignia of the cross. Everywhere it is outwardly honored and exalted. But the teachings of Christ are buried beneath a mass of senseless traditions, false interpretations, and rigorous exactions. The Savior's words concerning the bigoted Jews apply with still greater force to the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Matthew 23, 4. Conscientious souls are kept in constant terror, fearing the wrath of an offended God, while many of the dignitaries of the Church are living in luxury and sensual pleasure. The worship of images and relics, the invocation of saints, and the exaltation of the Pope are devices of Satan to attract the minds of the people from God and from his Son. To accomplish their ruin, he endeavors to turn their attention from him through whom alone they can find salvation. He will direct them to any object that can be substituted for the one who has said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11:28. It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. His sophistry lessens the obligation of the divine law and gives men license to sin. At the same time, he causes them to cherish false conceptions of God so that they regard him with fear and hate rather than with love. The cruelty inherent in his own character is attributed to the Creator. It is embodied in systems of religion and expressed in modes of worship. Thus the minds of men are blinded, and Satan secures them as his agents to war against God. By perverted conceptions of the divine attributes, heathen nations were led to believe human sacrifices necessary to secure the favor of deity, and horrible cruelties have been perpetrated under the various forms of idolatry. The Roman Catholic Church, uniting the forms of paganism and Christianity, and like paganism misrepresenting the character of God, has resorted to practices no less cruel and revolting. In the days of Rome's supremacy, there were instruments of torture to compel assent to her doctrines. There was the stake for those who would not concede to her claims. There were massacres on a scale that will never be known until revealed in the judgment. Dignitaries of the church studied under Satan their master to invent means to cause the greatest possible torture and not end the life of the victim. In many cases, the infernal process was repeated to the utmost limit of human endurance until nature gave up the struggle and the sufferer hailed death as a sweet release, the fate of Rome's opponents. For her adherents, she had the discipline of the scourge, of famishing hunger, of bodily austerities in every conceivable heart-sickening form. To secure the favor of heaven, penitents violated the laws of God by violating the laws of nature. They were taught to sunder the ties which he has formed to bless and gladden man's earthly sojourn. The churchyard contains millions of victims who spent their lives in vain endeavors to subdue their natural affections, to repress, as offensive to God, every thought and feeling of sympathy with their fellow creatures. If we desire to understand the determined cruelty of Satan, manifested for hundreds of years, not among those who never heard of God, 
but in the very heart and throughout the extent of Christendom, we have only to look at the history of Romanism. Through this mammoth system of deception, the prince of evil achieves his purpose of bringing dishonor to God and wretchedness to man. And as we see how he succeeds in disguising himself and accomplishing his work through the leaders of the church, we may better understand why he has so great antipathy to the Bible. If that book is read, the mercy and love of God will be revealed. It will be seen that he lays upon men none of these heavy burdens. All that he asks is a broken and contrite heart, a humble, obedient spirit. Christ gives no example in his life for men and women to shut themselves in monasteries in order to become fitted for heaven. He has never taught that love and sympathy must be repressed. The Savior's heart overflowed with love. The nearer man approaches to moral perfection, the keener are his sensibilities, the more acute is his perception of sin, and the deeper his sympathy for the afflicted. The Pope claims to be the Vicar of Christ, but how does his character bear comparison with that of our Savior? Was Christ ever known to consign men to the prison or the rack because they did not pay him homage as the King of Heaven? Was his voice heard condemning to death those who did not accept him? When he was slighted by the people of a Samaritan village, the Apostle John was filled with indignation and inquired, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Jesus looked with pity upon his disciple and rebuked his harsh spirit, saying, the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, Luke 9, 54 and 56. How different from the spirit manifested by Christ is that of his professed vicar. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose, but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy. L'Enfant, Volume 1, page 516, she declares, Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as a part of the Church of Christ? It is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from Protestantism than in former times. There has been a change, but the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism indeed resembles much of the Protestantism that now exists, because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the Reformers. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil, and as the inevitable result they will finally believe evil of all good. Instead of standing in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints, they are now, as it were, apologizing to Rome for their uncharitable opinion of her, begging pardon for their bigotry. A large class, even of those who look upon Romanism with no favor, apprehend little danger from her power and influence. Many urge that the intellectual and moral darkness prevailing during the Middle Ages favored the spread of her dogmas, superstitions, and oppression, and that the greater intelligence of modern times, the general diffusion of knowledge, and the increasing liberality in matters of religion forbid a revival of intolerance and tyranny. The very thought that such a state of things will exist in this enlightened age is ridiculed, it is true that great light, intellectual, moral, and religious, 
is shining upon this generation. In the open pages of God's holy word, light from heaven has been shed upon the world. But it should be remembered that the greater the light bestowed, the greater the darkness of those who pervert and reject it. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and to shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly seeking God that they may be led into the truth. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and of the power of God. They must have some means of quieting their consciences, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. A day of great intellectual darkness has been shown to be favorable to the success of the papacy. It will yet be demonstrated that a day of great intellectual light is equally favorable for its success. In past ages, when men were without God's word and without a knowledge of the truth, their eyes were blindfolded and thousands were ensnared, not seeing the net spread for their feet. In this generation there are many whose eyes become dazzled by the glare of human speculations, science falsely so called. They discern not the net and walk into it as readily as if blindfolded. God designed that man's intellectual powers should be held as a gift from his Maker and should be employed in the service of truth and righteousness. But when pride and ambition are cherished and men exalt their own theories above the Word of God, then intelligence can accomplish greater harm than ignorance. Thus, the false science of the present day, which undermines faith in the Bible, will prove as successful in preparing the way for the acceptance of the papacy with its pleasing forms, as did the withholding of knowledge in opening the way for its aggrandizement in the Dark Ages. In the movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages of the Church the support of the State, Protestants are following in the steps of papists. Nay, more, they are opening the door for the papacy to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she has lost in the old world. And that which gives greater significance to this movement is the fact that the principal object contemplated is the enforcement of Sunday observance, a custom which originated with Rome and which she claims as the sign of her authority. It is the spirit of the papacy, the spirit of conformity to worldly customs, the veneration for human traditions above the commandments of God that is permeating the Protestant churches and leading them on to do the same work of Sunday exaltation which the papacy has done before them. If the reader would understand the agencies to be employed in the soon coming contest, he has but to trace the record of the means which Rome employed for the same object in ages past. If he would know how Papists and Protestants, united, will deal with those who reject their dogmas, let him see the spirit which Rome manifested toward the Sabbath and its defenders. Royal edicts, general councils, and church ordinances sustained by secular power were the steps by which the pagan festival attained its position of honor in the Christian world. The first public measure enforcing Sunday observance was the law enacted by Constantine, A.D. 321. This edict required townspeople to rest on the venerable day of the sun, but permitted countrymen to continue their agricultural pursuits. Though virtually a heathen statute, it was enforced by the emperor after his nominal acceptance of Christianity. The royal mandate not proving a sufficient substitute for divine authority, Eusebius, a bishop who sought the favor of princes and who was the special friend and flatterer of Constantine, advanced the claim that Christ had transferred the Sabbath to Sunday. Not a single testimony of the scriptures was produced in proof of the new doctrine. Eusebius himself unwittingly acknowledges its falsity and points to the real authors of the change. All things, he says, whatever that it was duty to do on the Sabbath, these we have transferred to the Lord's Day. Robert Cox, Sabbath Laws and Sabbath Duties, page 538. But the Sunday argument groundless as it was, served to embolden men in trampling upon the Sabbath of the Lord. 
all who desired to be honored by the world accepted the popular festival. As the papacy became firmly established, the work of Sunday exaltation was continued. For a time, the people engaged in agricultural labor when not attending church, and the seventh day was still regarded as the Sabbath. But steadily, a change was effected. Those in holy office were forbidden to pass judgment in any civil controversy on the Sunday. Soon after, all persons of whatever rank were commanded to refrain from common labor on pain of a fine for freemen and stripes in the case of servants. Later it was decreed that rich men should be punished with the loss of half of their estates, and finally, that if still obstinate they should be made slaves, the lower classes were to suffer perpetual banishment. Miracles also were called into requisition. Among other wonders, it was reported that as a husbandman who was about to plow his field on Sunday cleaned his plow with an iron, the iron stuck fast in his hand, and for two years he carried it about with him. To his exceeding great pain and shame, Francis West, Historical and Practical Discourse on the Lord's Day, page 174. Later the Pope gave directions that the parish priest should admonish the violators of Sunday and wish them to go to church and say their prayers, lest they bring some great calamity on themselves and neighbors. An ecclesiastical council brought forward the argument, since so widely employed even by Protestants, that because persons had been struck by lightning while laboring on Sunday, it must be the Sabbath. It is apparent, said the prelates, how high the displeasure of God was upon their neglect of this day. An appeal was then made that priests and ministers, kings and princes, and all faithful people use their utmost endeavors and care that the day be restored to its honor, and for the credit of Christianity, more devoutly observed for the time to come, Thomas Morer discourses in six dialogues on the name, notion, and observation of the Lord's Day, page 271. The decrees of councils proving insufficient, the secular authorities were besought to issue an edict that would strike terror to the hearts of the people and force them to refrain from labor on the Sunday. At a synod held in Rome, all previous decisions were reaffirmed with greater force and solemnity. They were also incorporated into the ecclesiastical law and enforced by the civil authorities throughout nearly all Christendom. See Halen, History of the Sabbath, Part 2, Chapter 5, Section 7. Still the absence of scriptural authority for Sunday keeping occasioned no little embarrassment. The people questioned the right of their teachers to set aside the positive declaration of Jehovah, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in order to honor the day of the sun. To supply the lack of Bible testimony, other expedients were necessary. A zealous advocate of Sunday who about the close of the 12th century visited the churches of England was resisted by faithful witnesses for the truth, and so fruitless were his efforts that he departed from the country for a season and cast about him for some means to enforce his teachings. When he returned, the lack was supplied, and in his after labors he met with greater success. He brought with him a roll purporting to be from God himself, which contained the needed command for Sunday observance, with awful threats to terrify the disobedient. This precious document as base a counterfeit as the institution it supported, was said to have fallen from heaven and to have been found in Jerusalem upon the altar of St. Simeon in Golgotha. But in fact, the pontifical palace at Rome was the source whence it proceeded. Frauds and forgeries to advance the power and prosperity of the church have in all ages been esteemed lawful by the papal hierarchy. The rule forbade labor from the ninth hour, three o'clock, on Saturday afternoon till sunrise on Monday. Its authority was declared to be confirmed by miracles. It was reported that persons laboring beyond the appointed hour were stricken with paralysis. A miller who attempted to grind his corn saw, instead of flour, a torrent of blood come forth, and the mill wheel stood still, notwithstanding the strong rush of water. A woman who placed dough in the oven found it raw when taken out, though the oven was very hot. Another who had dough prepared for baking at the ninth hour, but determined to set it aside until Monday, found the next day that it had been made into loaves and baked by divine power. A man who baked bread after the ninth hour on Saturday found when he broke it the next morning that blood started therefrom. 
by such absurd and superstitious fabrications did the advocates of Sunday endeavor to establish its sacredness. See Roger de Hoveden, Annals, Volume 2, pages 528 to 530. In Scotland, as in England, a greater regard for Sunday was secured by uniting with it a portion of the ancient Sabbath. But the time required to be kept wholly varied. An edict from the King of Scotland declared that Saturday from twelve at noon ought to be accounted holy, and that no man from that time till Monday morning should engage in worldly business. Morer, pages 290 and 291. But notwithstanding all the efforts to establish Sunday sacredness, Papists themselves publicly confessed the divine authority of the Sabbath and the human origin of the institution by which it had been supplanted. In the 16th century, a papal council plainly declared, Let all Christians remember that the seventh day was consecrated by God and hath been received and observed not only by the Jews but by all others who pretend to worship God, though we Christians have changed their Sabbath into the Lord's Day, pages 281 and 282. Those who were tampering with the divine law were not ignorant of the character of their work. They were deliberately setting themselves above God. A striking illustration of Rome's policy toward those who disagree with her was given in the long and bloody persecution of the Waldenses, some of whom were observers of the Sabbath. Others suffered in a similar manner for their fidelity to the fourth commandment. The history of the churches of Ethiopia and Abyssinia is especially significant. Amid the gloom of the Dark Ages, the Christians of Central Africa were lost sight of and forgotten by the world, and for many centuries they enjoyed freedom in the exercise of their faith. But at last Rome learned of their existence, and the Emperor of Abyssinia was soon beguiled into an acknowledgment of the Pope as the Vicar of Christ. Other concessions followed. An edict was issued forbidding the observance of the Sabbath under the severest penalties. See Michael Geddes, Church History of Ethiopia, pages 311 and 312. But papal tyranny soon became a yoke so galling that the Abyssinians determined to break it from their necks. After a terrible struggle, the Romanists were banished from their dominions, and the ancient faith was restored. The churches rejoiced in their freedom, and they never forgot the lesson they had learned concerning the deception, the fanaticism, and the despotic power of Rome. Within their solitary realm they were content to remain unknown to the rest of Christendom. The churches of Africa held the Sabbath as it was held by the papal church before her complete apostasy. While they kept the seventh day in obedience to the commandment of God, they abstained from labor on the Sunday in conformity to the custom of the church. Upon obtaining supreme power, Rome had trampled upon the Sabbath of God to exalt her own. But the churches of Africa, hidden for nearly a thousand years, did not share in this apostasy. When brought under the sway of Rome, they were forced to set aside the true and exalt the false Sabbath. But no sooner had they regained their independence than they returned to obedience to the fourth commandment. These records of the past clearly reveal the enmity of Rome toward the true Sabbath and its defenders, and the means which she employs to honor the institution of her creating. The Word of God teaches that these scenes are to be repeated as Roman Catholics and Protestants shall unite for the exaltation of the Sunday. The prophecy of Revelation 13 declares that the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns shall cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the papacy, there symbolized by the beast like unto a leopard. The beast with two horns is also to say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, and furthermore it is to command all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, 11 through 16. It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns, and that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as the special acknowledgement of her supremacy. But in this homage to the papacy, the United States will not be alone. The influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed, and prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Verse 3. 
The infliction of the deadly wound points to the downfall of the papacy in 1798. After this, says the prophet, his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Paul states plainly that the man of sin will continue until the second advent, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-8. To the very close of time he will carry forward the work of deception, and the revelator declares, also referring to the papacy, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life, Revelation 13, 8. In both the old and the new world, the papacy will receive homage in the honor paid to the Sunday institution that rests solely upon the authority of the Roman Church. Since the middle of the 19th century, students of prophecy in the United States have presented this testimony to the world. In the events now taking place is seen a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of the prediction. With Protestant teachers, there is the same claim of divine authority for Sunday keeping and the same lack of scriptural evidence as with the papal leaders who fabricated miracles to supply the place of a command from God. The assertion that God's judgments are visited upon men for their violation of the Sunday Sabbath will be repeated. Already it is beginning to be urged, and a movement to enforce Sunday observance is fast gaining ground. Marvelous in her shrewdness and cunning is the Roman Church. She can read what is to be. She bides her time, seeing that the Protestant churches are paying her homage in their acceptance of the false Sabbath, and that they are preparing to enforce it by the very means which she herself employed in bygone days. Those who reject the light of truth will yet seek the aid of this self-styled, infallible power to exalt an institution that originated with her. How readily she will come to the help of Protestants in this work, it is not difficult to conjecture. Who understands better than the papal leaders how to deal with those who are disobedient to the Church? The Roman Catholic Church, with all its ramifications throughout the world, forms one vast organization under the control and designed to serve the interests of the papal see. Its millions of communicants in every country on the globe are instructed to hold themselves as bound in allegiance to the Pope. Whatever their nationality or their government, they are to regard the authority of the Church as above all other. Though they make the oath pledging their loyalty to the state, yet back of this lies the vow of obedience to Rome, absolving them from every pledge inimical to her interests. History testifies of her artful and persistent efforts to insinuate herself into the affairs of nations and having gained a foothold to further her own claims, even at the ruin of princes and people. In the year 1204, Pope Innocent III extracted from Peter II, King of Aragon, the following extraordinary oath. I, Peter, King of Aragonians, profess and promise to be ever faithful and obedient to my Lord, Pope Innocent, to his Catholic successors and the Roman Church and faithfully to preserve my kingdom in his obedience, defending the Catholic faith and persecuting heretical pravity, John Dowling, The History of Romanism, Book 5, Chapter 6, Section 55. This is in harmony with the claims regarding the power of the Roman pontiff, that it is lawful for him to depose emperors, and that he can absolve subjects from their allegiance to unrighteous rulers. Mosheim, Book 3, Century 11, Part 2, Chapter 2, Section 9, Note 17. And let it be remembered, it is the boast of Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory VII and Innocent III are still the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. And had she but the power, she would put them in practice with as much vigor now as in past centuries. Protestants little know what they are doing when they propose to accept the aid of Rome in the work of Sunday exaltation. While they are bent upon the accomplishment of their purpose, Rome is aiming to re-establish her power, to recover her lost supremacy. Let the principle once be established in the United States that the Church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws, in short, that the authority of Church and state is to dominate the conscience, and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. God's Word has given warning of the impending danger let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. 
She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution.